Hi guys, welcome to my channel or welcome back. I'm just kind of getting ready for the day and I'm going to be excessively yapping about, I guess, certain themes today. So I, I think I will put a trigger warning. Um, I think I'm just being very extremely open about things lately and it's good and yet confusing. <laughs> um, you know how it is. So anyways, uh, feel free to subscribe if you're interested in any of these things. I'm just going to be getting ready for the day and then yapping. Okay. So when I was a little kid, I had <laughs> excessive laughing fits and I've always had like impulse control issues. Um, and yeah, it could have been from trauma, whatever. I'm not saying it isn't, but I was not medicated as a child nor, um, allowed to exist so I was in this beautiful like ephemeral place of existing and not existing um and <laughs> so <laughs> I used to have these laughing fits right uh so much so that I would get kicked out of class and this one classroom I was in in like fourth grade right very very young age in fourth grade I wrote a note because I was watching the grim adventures of Billy and Mandy I wrote a note and I passed it around. We were sitting in a circle of desks and then there was like an entrance to where the teacher could go in and then like talk to all of us or whatever and like teach. And she was just trying, they would do like new teaching exercises where they would try something new to see how well it helped the children. And um, so anyways, so I wrote a note. I was watching The Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy and there was this one part in there where he was like, oh no, he's like taking a shower and he's like, this isn't shampoo, it's dog poo. Oh well, I'm still gonna use it. And so I thought that was funny. I thought that was funny. So I was like, I'm gonna write myself a note. No, I, I didn't think, I just did. So what I did in class, cause I was bored and like staring out the window and whatnot, I wrote, this isn't shampoo. And then at the bottom, I was like, it's dog poo. And then I folded it up and then I made it really tiny and I wrote on it, keep passing. Um, so then I was sitting right here at the front of the like opening the circle, you know? So like, and I passed the note to the person next to me and they kept passing it and they were confused. And I was like, pass it on, pass it on. Like telling people every time they looked up and they were like, who sent this? Who, who wrote this note? And I was like, And when it got back to me, I opened it up and I was like, acting like I didn't write it. And I was like, this is weird. And I opened it, and <laughs> I lost my shit. I lost my ever loving, God forsaking shit. <sighs> and I got kicked out of class. I had to take my desk outside and sit in the hallway where I continued my laughing fit until it had ran its course. And and I let out that like, you know, the exasperated sigh, the ah, you know what I mean? After you have a good laugh, uh, there's like, your body's like, okay, we're done. You know what I mean? I thought it was funny. I thought it was hilarious. Apparently not. Whatever. I don't care. <laughs> I thought it's funny. That's why I did it. And I didn't think, actually, I didn't think it was funny. I knew instinctively it was hilarious. So I did it. <laughs> and it, this is why I'm telling you this story. Because I have many, many strange occurrences where I accidentally run into people who are famous, like on accident, because I do something impulsive and it's a chain event of dominoes that leads to an accidental encounter. So I had to take my desk into the hallway and I was radiating with laughter. Now I lived in a tiny Texas town, one that is basically on the map, right? Uh, in the middle of nowhere. And there was nobody in the hallways. It was in the middle of class. So everybody, class was in session. Um, but it was just me and my desk and my laughter, right? And so I see some people at the end of the hall. It was a very, very long hall. And I was at the end of it just laughing. And then I saw them and I was like, oh, I should stop before I get in like serious trouble right because the teacher was kind of pushover and she was very nice and liberal so I was like how far can I push her how far can we do this dance together um I guess that was far enough so I was like damn I got kicked out of the house the, the class house right so after I ended my laughing session I see the people they're far enough away so they're just two shadows right and they're walking closer and I'm like whatever I'm gonna go use the restroom so I'm walking towards them because that's where the bathrooms were and um it was the teachers 
and Mario Lopez, like the guy from Saved by the Bell. <sighs> so it was Mario Lopez from Saved by the Bell. We live in the middle of fucking nowhere. We're in bumfuck Egypt, like nowhere, like nowhere, um, nowhere. So I found out via the, the um, teachers being enamored with them. They were like, isn't this amazing? Isn't this magical and fantastical? Look who has graced us with this presence today. Emily, don't you recognize who this is? And I was like, okay. I just got kicked out of class for laughing, like as deeply and hardly as I could. Who are you? <laughs> you know, like, okay, uh, whatever. And I was just kind of like that kind of a kid, like, okay, whatever. Um, and so she was like, it's Mario Lopez. And I was like, hi, nice to meet you. And he was just sitting there like, like, and like his Mario-ness. And I guess he had like a relative who went to that school. So, but he wasn't there to talk. He wasn't there to do anything. He was just there. And I was like, okay, <laughs> why the fuck are you here? Also, I'm a fourth grader and I just got kicked out of the class. Can I go to the bathroom now? Kind of thing. I was like, cool, whatever. So yeah, I thought that was really weird because like I said, I was like, why is he here? And like, as an adult, I was like, what the fuck was that? And when I tell people that story, they're like, and I'm like, that's weird. That's suspicious. Why are you the Mario? Nah, he probably doesn't remember. Um, but yeah, I thought that was very, very strange. So yeah, like I said, I was like in fourth grade and he showed up to my fucking school, but he wasn't like, there was no al alert. There was no Mario Lopez day or any of that. He was just like wandering the halls with the teachers being like escorted, I guess, to go see his relative or something that maybe worked there maybe went there i don't fucking know it was very vague it, like i said i was in fourth grade and i'm almost 32 so <laughs> um it was weird another time i accidentally met somebody famous like it happens a lot on accident and it's usually like i said my impulses lead me to a uh, trickling events of <laughs> like what i do like i impulsively do something i think is hilarious or just i just impulsively exist without really thinking on the moments that like because I overthink so much sometimes it's good to just let that horse out of the stable and then run through the pastures so sometimes I'll just clock out and let my impulses go but they're not like negative it's not like I negatively impact anybody's life I'm just like super annoying right you guys know me right so we're friends so yeah I'm just like super fucking annoying when I finally let my impulses out and it's very difficult for people to relate to me whenever I am in that impulsive like Mm, it's not mania. It's something. It's, I don't know. So, um, me and my friend were like 14 and 15. I was older. And her dad drops us off at this bar in Houston, right? Because Red Jumpsuit Apparatus and like Tickle Me Pink and a couple other people were playing there that night. And she had gotten us tickets or something. It's a vague mirror. A vague, a vague memory. It's very vague. Um, what happened? So, I like as an adult i'm like dude i would never fucking do that i would have at least stayed but she had a cell phone i did not <laughs> isn't that funny and peculiar we got dropped off at like a fucking bar or a coffee house or something to watch some bands play in houston and i thought it was the coolest shit ever i was like wow this is fun whatever who cares like my mom has been like a bar woman her whole life so i didn't see anything wrong with it i was just like whatever that's where people play in bars you know what i mean like you go to bars for live music. I, I wasn't really thinking like, this is weird. I'm 15 or I was 14. She was 13, something like that. We were very young, very young, but she had a phone and we were trusted to be picked up at a certain spot at that time, whatever. And he was a musician. Her father was a musician, like an old school country guy, right? He writes country songs and he like sells them and things of that nature. But everybody's super humble. And like, really like we're all like kind of in this blue collar town and things like that, right? So he drops us off at the front of the bar thing and we're gonna go in and watch the bands play, right? It's very dark, it's late at night. 
<laughs> the street lights are broken um you know there's like that you could feel the base and it's like in this corner crevice of this strip mall that's like dying and dead and it's like then again like we could die but we were just like i guess we're gonna go see these fans or whatever you know what i mean um and so we're waving at him like bye like and we're gonna be good girls because we were really good girls at that time so i guess he had trusted us enough to do the right thing but god he really trusted everybody else to not like like that's a lot of trust i don't have perhaps i'm envious because i wish i could have that kind of <sighs> freeness of decision making to be like i trust you to do the right thing and we did do the right thing and it was a really cool interaction which is very peculiar i don't personally understand it because i have so much trauma that it would never allow me to let my children go to some bar in the middle of houston in a like a vacant creepy strip mall <laughs> Um, with a bunch of grown men, you know, um, what? Anyways, give me a second. I got to recover from this. There was this angel there and he kept, cause there was like a pit, right? You know, a mosh pit, you know what I mean? Like a pit. And I love pits. Pits are fun. I like, I like the communal shit beating that happens and everyone's just okay with it. One time somebody threw an entire Asian woman at my face. <laughs> like through her um but she maybe weighed like 98 pounds but she hit me so hard like her we were knocked on the floor and she's like i'm sorry like they had put her like as into like crowd serve her but instead she landed on my face which is fine i mean i think anybody would be fine with a beautiful asian girl landing on their face and i was so i was like nah fuck yeah let's put you back up but she had hit me so hard in my ears and my ears are gauged I've had them gauged since like sixth grade, um, but she hit me so hard that my blood started pouring all over my face because it knocked my gauge out because a fucking body hit my face, right? I'm surprised I woke up and was fine. Um, but we were in the pit and also people were crowd surfing. So, you know, it fucking happens, right? I think it was like Flogging Molly and uh, some other bands. Anyways, it doesn't matter. So we're there. Asian girl hits me straight in the face with her full fucking body. I'm sorry. I'm like, fuck it. Let's go. Let's get you out there. And so I was like, you want to go all the way to the stage? Let's happen. So what would happen is you crowd surf to the stage. You get on stage. Woo! You do this number. And then the, um, how do you say? The bouncers, like, show for you back to the crowd. And then you make your way through the crowd of sweaty people. And then you go back to your friends and you're like, did you see that? And they're like, yeah. Um. That's how it happens. I don't know if you've ever been to like a, that's how it used to happen. I don't know how it happens now. 2020 changed everything. But back in the early 2000s and late 2000s, in the early 2010s, um, what would happen is like, you know, there was just the ecstasy of music and people and sweat and things of that nature. And so there is always one guy, one really sweet, absolute bear of a man who had like contacts and studded belts everywhere and spikes and collars and punk hair, like one completely like beautiful punk soul, like the most, he looked like Satan himself, but he was like a fucking angel or something. And he would ask very calmly like, do you want to go up? And then people would be like, yeah. And so he'd be like, I got you. And then he signals to the crowd, we got one here. And then he'd like, and then they'd crowd surf you. It was so much fun. It was so much fun. Um, I liked crowd surfing. It was a lot of fun just having everybody be like, whoa, 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 and like roll you over like a taco into the stage and throw you on stage. It was fun but the pit is really fun too where everybody like communally beats the shit out of each other that's a lot of fun i don't know there's some there's some differences in alternative cultures that do not um resonate correctly in not our alternative I alternative cultures there's something in the, there's a snake in my boot now that there's something very intimate and understandable and respectful in alternative circles like the, it's not abuse it is like communal like rage and like it's almost like a mammalian play where you know how you see cats fighting each other and smacking the shit out of each other but it's a game they don't mean it and when they mean it it's different or dogs you know how dogs do that mouth thing they're like ah, ah. but they're not they don't mean it i think that there is this expression that happens in like 
alternative music and I mean alternative as in everything from like metal to dark way, like everything, you know? I've never seen a pit of a Taylor Swift concert. Um, but perhaps it exists. I think that would be peculiar. Um anyways, so I got hit in the face with this Asian girl. We put her back up and went. But then um one of my friends was standing too close. So we had tons of tickets to this uh festival where there was tons of different bands playing. Um, Medvane, Puddle of Mud, like a lot of different bands and you had to wander to each um, stage at different times to witness them and they were playing at similar times so you had to pick which band you wanted to see, right? Um, so anyways, yeah, that was fun. It was a lot of fun. It, this is a lot of fun. My friend was standing too close in the pit and somebody decked her in the chest and knocked her out and uh, she, she was like, what the fuck? And I was like, why are you in the pit? Go. <laughs> she was just in the pit like this. Like... And then she got knocked the fuck out. And I was, like... I was like, hey, are you okay? <laughs> you know, I was like, get the fuck out of the pit. Um, yeah, anyways, so pits are fun. Back to the bar story. Back to the like bar thing. Okay, so her father, my friend's father drops us off, right? My friend's father drops us off and we're waving at him by in his truck and he's like, you know, and there's a man crossing the, uh, the blacktop where we're at. We got dropped off in front of the bar and it's very dark and scary and like radiating, like, <laughs> like bass, you could feel it. It's like alluring you into it and stuff like that. And so we're waiting at her dad. You know what I mean? We're all dressed up in our like alternative garb or whatever for the night. And this guy is walking past and he goes to us and we were like, oh, I'm sorry, we're not talking to you. We were talking to her father because <laughs> we were 14 and 15, right? And he was ended up being the lead singer of the band like that we were going to go see that night. We were watching the uh, like red jumpsuit apparatus and um, how do you say tickle me pink or whatever. And um, a long time ago, right? And so he was like, oh, I'm sorry. It ended up being the lead singer of the band. And I thought that was so funny because I end up accidentally meeting famous people um, or whatever, people of notoriety, people above me or whatever, what the fuck ever, people who people know, right? I accidentally come into contact with them on accident. I'm like, hey, cool, whatever. Uh, like with Mario Lopez, that was so weird. I was like, what the fuck are you doing here, Mario? You know what I mean? And so, <laughs> even as an adult, I'm like, what the fuck was he doing there, though? Like, can somebody tell me what the fuck he was doing there? Um, what are you doing? Picking on a sacrifice, honey? It better not be me. I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm just joking. But, um, yeah, so me and my friend were, like, standing outside talking to this lead singer. The lead singer of the band. But we were just like... Okay. Um, like, whatever. Because we were children, babies, you know? Um, he was like, well, I was at the corner store. I was trying to see if I could score some Jaeger. And <laughs> we're 14 and 15. Very, very young little girls. And I'm just like, why the fuck are you talking to us? And he was like, I gotta go inside now and do a sound check. And I was just like, and I looked at her and I was like, okay. Why are you talking to us? I wish I had whatever um, that is to uh, allow myself to feel like um, capable of doing things. Like I feel because of the amount of trauma I've gone through like on a very, very serious note now. I know I've been joking this whole time, but on a very serious note, um, the amount of trauma I've gone through, mm, red tapes, the kind of experiences that I allow myself to have, and it's a personal sensation. I have a fear now, a true deep, dark fear of um, what if, you know what I mean? And so I make these pleasurable illusions of like actually doing something like, you know, going out 
to a place and things of that nature and then I destroy them which sometimes is <laughs> detrimental because it is fun creating illusions within our heads of um, you know things that may or may not happen and then the reality of the situation is like I'm too much of a chicken shit now in my 30s to really go out and enjoy life in the way I want um, and that impulsive nature I had as a child has calmed down some and also like I noticed that if I take my antidepressants um, it goes in the background it goes in the background and it's just slightly there <laughs> you know what I mean just slightly but I'm able to like not listen to those impulsive thoughts and they're not okay they're not dangerous and they're not harmful they're funny and they're sweet and they kind of feel like very childlike they like trickster deities that's what they feel like they feel like they are words from a trickster um funny things things that domino affect me into the limelight or whatever for a moment's time and i'm just like okay um I accidentally, well not accident. well no, I was forced, sometimes I get forced into the limelight on accident. I do, I get forced because I'm codependent. So, here's another thing. Uh, I am a, uh, whenever I, I have a job or I'm serving somebody that I think is adequate of my time and space and I believe in your mission, like when I'm truly serving another individual, uh, like at a job, you know what I mean? Like, in the act of servitude. You know what I'm saying? Like, going to work is an act of servitude, you know? Uh, service. When I'm in service to other humans and I agree with their mission, uh, I am extremely codependent and I am a yes man. And I hate that about myself. But I understand it, right? So, I will... I think that's where my fear comes from as well. Like, that uh, understanding of my nature the know thy that know thyself aspect of me is just like you i know you and you know you don't get connected to humans because you'll <laughs> you'll lose yourself in them uh stay home with your farm animals and take care of your farm animals and then stay away from the humans you silly silly girl but i genuinely want to be a human i genuinely want to be around humans it's just sometimes i'm too aware and then i understand why they do, they do the things they do and I do the things I do. And I'm like, oh, if I allow myself to become attached to you, you don't understand. I would die for you. So let me just back up. Let me reel myself in because I, <laughs> I have attachment issues. So let me just isolate myself on purpose to protect myself. I'm sorry. It has nothing to do with you. Mm, you know. <sighs> so. I get thrust into the limelight on accident sometimes, um, especially because of my codependent nature. I, I am a yes man. So a news station called my work when I worked at a metaphysical shop and they were like, we need this, this and this from you for a segment we're going to be filming and doing tomorrow on live TV. They gave me no time to prepare, absolutely no time to prepare, um, but I'm such a theater kid that and a yes man and codependent and I don't know I think the breed or flavor of trauma I have allows me to just like click out and like do things and then I even surprise myself at how well I've done them because I'm like I feel like that wasn't even me doing the thing which is sometimes dangerous right that's spooky but whenever you do theater or acting you can understand and resonate with what I'm saying sometimes it is like um like in voodoo what they call is like being ridden like a possession of like the character you're playing um and it is like uh it's a like a, how you ride a horse and so the in voodoo and hoodoo the the um the loa or the deities will come down and ride you and use your body and use you to you know do things and it's like a full body possession or something like that okay um, I'm just trying to relate it to something that I know so I can like relate what I'm saying with you. So they needed an astrologer, a tarot card reader. I am an astrologer and I do tarot card readings, so I don't anymore. Um, but I, 
<laughs> I've done them for, at that point, it was like over 13 years I had been doing them, studying tarot and astrology. So I was like, okay. And so they looked at me and they were like, you, hey, tomorrow, come to work and dress nice, wear something cute or something nice because you're going to be doing astrological readings on the news live to two of the morning anchors. And I was like, I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, <laughs> they were like, don't, you could do it, right? You could do this for us, right? You can do this, right? And I was just like, yeah, of course, <laughs> anything for you. Um, and I guess like looking back, I'm like, you dumb bitch. But at the same time, I was grateful for the experience. Now, let me get into the experience. So I was alone. I was going to be driven there by somebody who has, they do not work at the store, okay, that I was working at, but they are a friend of the people who work at the store. Now, I'm not going to tell you anything else about this person because the things I need to tell you are <laughs> strange. Okay, so I get thrusted into the limelight on accident, right? Always on accident. Never on purpose. Like, if I wanted to be like, oh, I want to go be famous, it, like, would not work. But if I accidentally exist and follow my impulses and just <laughs> say yes, I trickle down into accidental awareness and everyone being aware of me. It doesn't matter. Anyways. So, I stay up all night researching the information because she... Without even having my consent, she like signed me up for something, my manager, to go beyond the fucking news. And I was like, oh, okay. And then I was getting flack from other people that worked there because they were like, she's just, she doesn't even go here. No, I'm kidding. They were, just, they were like, she's just a counter girl. She's just a manager. But like, I also had this skill set and I'm really good at my job. And like I said, I could snap out of this me and snap into like there's a business aspect of myself that i could snap into and i just like shut off and i can just pump out information so I, I i can just shut off myself and then allow information to flow freely like a fucking robot it's not good but it's something i know about myself that when i do work or i do serve i'm very good at what i do and um i don't know what it is it doesn't matter so I, it's just I think, like I said, if you're like familiar with acting and being a theater kid and all that shit like I am, there's just something that happens. Like you just, you can click off yourself, right? Um, and yeah, I think that if you're traumatized, it works way better. Um, and I was traumatized. So, and ugh, I just wanted so badly to be loved and accepted. Uh, especially because I think my manager was a female and I really needed like that kind of intimate feminine connection and I didn't want to let her down because then I would feel like such a failure and that goes into my own issues, right? But we're not going to put that on right now. So I stay up all night researching the astrological charts of the two news anchors that I'm going to be um, interviewing and the person who is driving me to the studio so I can go in. It's like Fox News, right? Or a Fox News studio. So they had like on the, the thing, they had like a lot of, how do you say? Um, fall TV shows coming soon. Like all of the Fox things like for in the hallways, they have like posters of the shows they're proud of and that are on the air for Fox this um, coming season or now airing, you know? So I'm walking down this hallway to the green room and a green room is where like you hang out until you're needed, basically, until you go on live, right? And so I'm <laughs> I'm in my Sunday best, and I have this really beautiful, like, flowy blue, like, <laughs> beaded, with, like, bell sleeves, like, um, cute blue dress on. And at the time, I had really long blonde hair, and it was in perfect little, like, little, <laughs> as you say, like, Shirley Temple curls, like, very cute, like, ringlets all over. And... I looked like a doll. I was so adorable that I was also cosplaying as a normal person <laughs> because I was like, I don't know, just I wanted, it doesn't matter. 
I put myself through an extraordinary amount of stress to be loved and accepted at that time period in my life, and it was extremely unfortunate uh, for my mental health. So anyways, I'm sitting in the green room, right? And the girl, the person, I'm not gonna say girl, the person who drove me there has a backpack of their things that they carry around every day. And we live in Texas, and Texas is an open carry state, okay? They didn't check her bag. The security guard did not check her bag. At, um, or anything. Like, we just, we just came into the news station. And I didn't know what was in her bag. So, we're in the green room, and there is a girl from Morgan's Wonderland there. And if you don't know what Morgan's Wonderland, it's this really fantastical place where a lot of people with special needs or they're also like disability friendly amusement park uh, in San Antonio, Texas. It's a beautiful place, but I believe like I was in the green room with, um, I think maybe, I don't know if it was like, like Morgan herself or just there was a, somebody who had like special needs that was in the green room with me and um, they're like caretakers, they're the people taking care of them. And so I was sitting in my area kind of just holding my astrological reports that I had printed out and laminated and done the night before because I'm an all or nothing person and I'm so codependent that I, and, and a yes man, that I did put myself through like extraordinary excruciating amount of like stress to make sure that I did not fail my manager or the store because like I wanted to be a good daughter to the store or something like that. I don't know. I have problems <laughs> and I've talked to my therapist about them. Anyways, so I'm sitting there holding on to my astrological charts and I can see a chart and boom, I can, I have, I've studied astrology for so long that you can tell me your three signs rising. You can just tell me you're rising in your sun sign and my brain is like, <laughs> and it will create a chart immediately. And then I can tell you things. Um, I don't know why. It's just something that has happened, I guess, from excessive amounts of devouring information on astrology. So all I had to do is really print out their charts and look at them. And I was able to tell them very, very accurate information. And um, some of the information I couldn't say on the news because it was like about certain aspects of their sexuality and that was extremely rude and non-consensual to get into that. But I, I didn't talk to um, the news anchors before um, leaving the green room and going on set. <laughs> and set was extremely funny because it looked exactly like my old drama teachers like how she made sets it was tons of chords it was like an electronic beast of chords and cameras and lighting and it's all so fictitious and interesting because from this tiny tiny thing you see me but you don't see everything else you know what i'm saying and on a large scale like fox news scale you are seeing what they want you to see but you do not see like the jungle vines of massive amounts of tape and cords that are behind the camera and the amount of control it takes to create this illusion that you're perceiving so it was very very interesting and it was very illuminating um and i love um like i said i love that kind of stuff so i was just devouring the experience but back to the green room. So I'm in the green room with somebody who has special needs and they have a sash because it was fiesta time in Texas or not Texas, in San Antonio. They have fiesta and they do like a battle of the flowers um, and parades and floats. And it's a time where like the Hispanic and Mesoamerican culture just celebrates um, spring. Basically, we have flowers and, and sashes that you wear and everybody like in the town or the city is not a town and san antonio will have um medallions or medals that you could go and get and then add them to your vest or your sash or your fiesta attire and there's like beautiful women in these exotic dresses dancing and there's so much like drinking and eating and fun and it's just like carnival 
but or um how do you say the thing in new orleans that i love so much how do you say this word not carnival but it's um is that tuesday mardi gras that's how you, mardi gras it's like carnival mardi gras fiesta so it's like all of these like cultures have this exhilarating burst of vitality life force and like uh like ecstasy and partying around springtime which aligns with like lambs having children and like the sexual energy that is revitalized within mammals um after winter is harsh like grip it's like everything starts blooming and like all of the microorganisms in the soil return back into the trees and the mycelium and the spores and everything start bursting again and, and fruiting and everything is like redeposited into this um earthly realm after sleeping in the dark deep velvet rich darkness of the underworld right so fiesta so she has her fiesta sash on and like her medallions and they're they're trying to prep her for going on and so they're continually asking her things and when is your birthday like what is your name so that way she feels trained and, and like good enough to um lose some of the anxiety which there's tons of anxiety about going on to tv you know what i'm saying um so they're just trying to prep her and like make her feel safe and like everything and i understand that while i'm having a psychotic breakdown on the inside looking at my astrological reports um in the corner of the green room and the person who drove me there is like going through their backpack like just watching and she's like they're like this is so amazing this is so fun this is so cool right like this is really cool like aren't you are you excited are you nervous little asking me things and i'm just like quiet with my like goldilock curls and my pretty blue dress and i'm just like yeah this is a great experience i'm so grateful for this experience and then um so she's going through her backpack and she realizes that she had brought with her into the studio and so she goes <laughs> and she zips her backpack up after she like look because she doesn't say anything <laughs> we're in the green room and it's very intimate very close everybody's very close but she unzips her backpack she went to go get something else like her phone or something and she accidentally realizes so she accidentally realizes there is a in her purse right and it's an open carry state or whatever but then on top of all the mixed anxiety of like being on tv staying up all night um having astrological reports everything everything all at once everything anything and nothing all at once of course why wouldn't my chauffeur to the thing be packing like why not so now i have a new horror <laughs> I can go to jail. I don't know. I, like, I didn't know the law back then, and I was like... Pull it together. You know? And so, when they were like... They checked on me, they're like, Hey, you're gonna go on and blah, blah, blah. Are you, are you guys okay? And I just looked at them like... Of course. <laughs> like, of course we're fine. We're okay. Everything's normal. And I just clocked out of myself. I literally had, like, a fucking out-of-body experience and just allowed... Like, I remember, I don't remember really walking through the hallways. I remember the flyers, the posters of, like, what was playing for that season or whatever. It wasn't fall. It must have been spring. So what had been playing on Fox, the Fox channel, right? And going to the set, going to the area that I was supposed to be in, and it was like they were, everyone was like, be quiet. And nobody said anything. So there's a lot of nonverbal communication communication and wires you had to walk over and wires you had to be careful of and um it's very very interesting it's a very interesting experience but because of my codependent nature i really have to watch myself because i will get myself into dumb fucking situations because i just wanted like love and acceptance and to not let someone down that's how it started. It started off with me being a little bitch and not being able to say no. 
to my manager because I just wanted like she was like we're like family right like we're like family and so you would never let the family down right and I had such an issue with my own family that I had really become a part of this store and the family of that store but it was just a business it was just a business and they had totally reeled me in so well they had me in a fucking chokehold pinned down where I was barely breathing unless they wanted me to breathe and I allowed that but I didn't know any better and I know a lot of people don't make it out of situations like that basically cults but yeah it was really strange so I go on set and then I sit down I clock out I do my readings I don't know what I said but I say something and I left the set, I went back in the car, and I went <laughs> back to the store, back to my job, and I started working. And they were like, wow, blah, 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 blah. How was it? How was it? How was it? And I was just sitting there, like, completely overtaken by everything that had happened. Staying up all night, doing violent research. Um laminating astrological charts, printing out papers, making sure that I was presentable and <laughs> like what they wanted me to be. Going to the studio, experiencing all of that. And like in a way, it's what I really desired was to be and like, I don't know, like I said, I, I when I was younger, I really wanted to go and do things like that to work on movies or to do special effects or something to create that kind of art you know what I mean like but I also wanted to be a mortician so I had two great loves in my life when I was a child two great desires I wanted to be a mortician mostly an embalmer I wanted to do the like you know be a coroner or whatever I wanted to take care of the dead that was a huge huge thing for me and it still is to this day it still is and one day maybe in a couple years i will go to the academy and fucking get my license i will fucking somehow get the money to go be a fucking mortician and because it's something i really want and i still have such a fucking yearn for such a fucking uh connection to and desire to be And then my other great love was um, wanting to work in theater and on films and like behind the scenes and and writing and um, like poetry and writing and special effects and all that stuff, which is interesting because I think there's a lot <laughs> that says a lot about me, but those have been two, my two great loves. It has been like film and theater and behind the scenes stuff and like working in the drama department, right? and like that kind of stuff and then also uh taking care of the dead and like making sure that they have a proper passage from here to there and that they're taken care of and that somebody like that they know that somebody loves them enough i don't know it's very strange so anyways yeah uh long story short i accidentally get thrusted into the limelight and meet people that are technically famous or something like that on accident it happens a lot well, not a lot, but if I follow my impulses or if I clock out and allow things to happen, like if I don't hold such a control on my life like I do now, um, then I will have a lot of really magnificent and strange experiences. But there's always like the yin and the yang. Like I said, I was like so all or nothing. And even now, it actually, I could feel a physical sensation in my body of pain. Um, and stress just thinking about and reliving and sharing that experience but I I isn't it so important that somebody out there knows that that it wasn't just like something that I have to hide um in I don't want to hide that these are my experiences this is what fucking happened to me and was it glamorous this much was it terrifying this much was it fucking insane this much did i have fun yes but there was there was a 
I don't want to explain it. There's like a pendulum swing of everything. There was just such a pendulum swing of like so many things. Like I said, like being codependent, doing whatever it takes to make you happy because I believe in, in you at this time and I, I love you and you're my family. And so I don't want to disappoint you and all of these things. And I want to be like the best little doll for you to use and manipulate like a little puppet. Like I am everything that you could ever want and ever need, right? Just do not abandon me kind of thing. And then, okay, well, I have a job for you. And I think she did it because she thought it was going to fucking fail. I think she did it out of spite and cruelty. I don't think it was because she really, I know it was because she really enjoyed my company. I think it was because I was such a yes man that I, and I was so good at what I was doing because I would pour every aspect of my soul into it. And I was widely liked um, everybody knew me, everybody talked to me, I think it was a cruel, jealous thing she did to me. Like, I couldn't do it, she thought, like, for sure. Less than 24 hour notice, she's gonna fail. I don't think it was something that was, um, out of the kindness of her heart, because she was a cruel and unusual person. She was extraordinarily cruel, and a narcissist, a manipulator, an embezzler, and a liar. So... I think she did it as a cruel joke and yet this series of impulses that I had led and spun me into like a very beautiful exhilarating and uh, <laughs> dangerous situation and so when I say things on my channel such as I have been in very dangerous situations and I've always felt like something has been there like a guiding light protecting me even though when I'm there in the darkness and there are things all around me moving that I cannot identify, I'm still shielded. I still have to walk through this dark tunnel, but I'm essentially shielded, but I still experience the walk through the tunnel. It's a very strange phenomenon that has happened since I was born. I go into these deep, dark sewers where there are things that you could hear and not see there are sensations that you can't explain. And even though I try to explain them, like I'm here sitting here, I'm letting myself open and explaining my experiences because I don't wanna be alone anymore. And I think that they are such bizarre experiences. Um, they are almost unbelievable. Actually, no, they are fucking unbelievable. Um, God, I just, I feel so bad about myself i feel so bad because i'm like you poor pathetic soul fuck what the fuck so a lot of my reeling in isolation shit like that is because i've had such fucked off experiences when i've tried to do the things that i want to do i've tried to achieve the goals i tried to receive um how do you say like love from people incapable of loving themselves which was stupid my codependency and loneliness has gotten me into some strange situations so i keep a tight leash on myself on purpose and it's important for me to do that to protect me from myself <laughs> Do you know what I mean? There was another time that I was thrust into the fucking limelight when I worked at that place. And we had to go to a separate news channel and do a Friday the 13th thing. And I was supposed to, it was a lot more loose at this studio. It was a lot more like intimate fun, hee hee ho ho. They were like downtown and they were like, when you, you could pass by them and there was um, like glass panels you just walk by or whatever and you can like stand outside and be like, oh my god, the news station, right? Like, oh my god, look at him go. So it was a lot more loose, and we did, like, it was three of us, right? It was a triad of people from the store, and um, it was pretty cool because they wanted to know the superstitions on, like, malojo or the evil, the evil eye, you know, the malojo, maldejo, the evil eye, maldejo or malojo, and, um, different things like black cats, crystal balls, blah, 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 right? We were a metaphysical shop, so um, 
we specialize in all things metaphysical and the occult. And so, um, so I was there and I was supposed to do like, um, there's an eclipse happening or something like that. And I was supposed to do astrology and tarot as like a cookie fun thing. Like we have these freaks on the news today. That's how it was. It was very, <laughs> it went from like a very serious, like, um, one-on-one, -on -one, not one-on-one, -on -one, it was like one-on-two, like interaction at the Fox station to like this other one which was like very erratic and fun you know and so it was like what the fuck ever okay this is a uh, whatever we waited there for a couple hours and we watched like we had to sit in the audience which was like a couple bar stools behind the camera <laughs> it was a very tiny operation but it was fun to say the least so it was a bunch of bar stools behind the camera and the person doing the quick editing was like in like this fucking deer blind behind the set and everything was so funny. It's just such an illusion. It's cardboard cutouts, paper, slapped together, one camera broadcasting to all of San Antonio. And so, so I was there and they were like, wear the shirt, wear the shirt for the blah, blah, blah. And like, you need to bring your cards. And we had to bring props. And they were quickly exchanging, like they had a musician on, they would interview and blah, blah, blah. And then they'd have five minutes and they'd come talk to us and they'd be like, okay, hair and makeup. And talking to their producer and blah, 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 talking to us, right? And so they're like, okay, are you gonna, no, they're editing right now. They're gonna pull some slides from a couple years ago when we were interviewing you guys, and then we're gonna piece them together and put them together, and then you'll go on, and then we're gonna talk, okay? I'm gonna talk to you for first, you second, and you third, okay? And when they got to me, they were like, um, one of the girls, one of the girlies, that was the, there was also double news anchors there, right? I believe they were both, I can't remember, but they were both the same, how do you say? Sun sign, they were both the same sun sign. So it was so cute to see both of them, two of the same sun signs interacting with each other and pumping out like information to San Antonio and like goofing off or whatever. But the little cute one, there was like a tall big one that was funny and more masculine, but the little feminine cute one, she had like these doe eyes and she was so beautiful. And um, she had a bodyguard, a big man that would like walk her everywhere. And she was so cute and she's like, it was just the cutest like normal girl you know like she was like 4 11 or something like long natural dark hair big beautiful eyes dewy skin even though she could have been anywhere from 30 to 50 anywhere in between there she had like the beautiful like it girl smile and she was just like god mary mother of jesus or something like just you know like there's like a normal like, you could tell that barely anything wrong has ever happened to her in her whole life. Like, she had two fucking parents, a family that loved her and everything. And I would just look at her like, wow. But she had, like, these big, beautiful doe eyes. And um, she was like, she talked to me and she was like, I go and get tarot readings all the time. And, like, she was, like, talking to me. Like, she was, like, whispering. Kind of like she wanted to tell me her dark little secrets. And I was like, eee! And she was like, <laughs> because she was like, what, what can you see about me? What can you see about my things? What can you see about my aura? You know what I mean? Like, she was just so cute, though, because she was like one of those girls. I can't explain it, but she was just so cute and innocent and also like had like very far in the background of her personality, a darkness that she kept under very strict like you could never tell but she came right up to me and she was like can you tell what I'm thinking can you see my aura can you do a reading for me real quick and then she was like I love going to your shop I love getting readings and stuff like that so she had like this whole um god she was so adorable and I was just like you're crazy <laughs> like she looked so normal. She looked so fucking normal. And she was like the prettiest, perfect girl. And then truthfully behind the mask, like behind the mask, behind those doe eyes, I was like, oh my God, but she would never ever fucking admit it. You could hold something to her and be like, admit you get ratings. And she would just be like, me? Never. I would never do that. She was like this like 1940s beautiful feminine person. And it was freaking me out because she came right up to me and was like, 
And then she went right back to like, hi guys, you know? And I was like, you're crazy. I love you. I love a good, I love a crazy person because it's, we, why? I can't imagine getting through life and not being absolutely like fucking insane. Um, but she held it together so well and that, I was so envious because I was like, I wish that I could, <laughs> I can't, but it is so admirable that you are. And I was just so fascinated <laughs> after that. I was like, <sighs> You know what I mean? Because on, on the TV, she's like quirky, cute, like really funny, sweet, la 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 girl. She's like, hee -hee -hee -hee. and then behind the scenes, she's like, <laughs> and then she goes back to like, so anyways, you know, and I don't know. That was so cool. I wish I could hold all of my like crazy stuff hostage and just not. <laughs> tell like obviously i don't think she would ever be the kind of person to go on youtube and be like yeah one time i went to the news station and my chaperone had an interpersonal accident oh it was so crazy in the green room we found out um and then i was just fearful of my life after that because i was like wow who is this person i'm sitting next to really and truly like i don't think that this woman would have ever done that like it's so cool i don't know i don't understand it i wish that i could <laughs> hide so well and I don't know it was like kind of like American Psycho you know what I mean like but in a cute way I don't know <laughs> American Psycho with a little bow <laughs> like a little pink bow like ee, little pigtails like American Psycho and I was like oh, you're crazy like I know she goes to the Botanicas in San Antonio like through the back door kind of thing do you know what I mean and they let her like I know she has a whole, whole deep, dark, rich part of her. And uh, I was so intimidated because I was like, you're doing it. You're doing what I always wanted to do, which is like, you know, like, I don't know. It's like broadcasting theater, stuff like that, right? The seeing the mechanism, seeing, being in the belly of the beast and then like watching it. Like, it's just so interesting. It also knocks away the illusions that you have because, like I said, there's like a, there's a very good, cheap, it's a very cheap, don't say that. Um, hmm. Let me find the proper word. Hold up. I'm just going to tell you what I was going to say and just, it's a cheap fuck whenever you are sitting here in front of like a television set and um, you don't see all of this stuff behind. Like I said, it's just paper, cardboard, and glue, as well as thousands of different jungle vines of wires and lighting in a dark room in like a crevice somewhere. It's very strange to be behind the camera and see everything, but I also find it extremely pleasurable to, like I find a lot of respect. So, okay, in it, and um, but like I said, it is like a cheap fuck. You know what I mean? It's like a cheap mind fuck. Let's put it that way. Um, and so, I don't know how to explain it. Um, and when I tell my friends about it, I feel like they get a little, um, it's like when people say don't meet your heroes, you know what I mean? Um, I met my desire, which was like to be a part of theater, drama, broadcasting, things like that. I really enjoy the opera and like, I'm trying to get my husband to go to ballet, but it's very difficult for him to go and enjoy stuff. It's so difficult. I wish I had a friend that I could go with to like the Houston Ballet and I've tried to order tickets and just like kidnap him and like take him there. But then like he gets an alert on his phone that I've bought tickets and then so then he knows. So I can't kidnap him. But I'd like to go to the ballet. I used to go all the time as a kid. I used to go to opera, ballet, uh, fucking, how do you say, musicals and stuff. I, for some reason, I moved around a lot as a child. Um, all over Texas. And I used to live in, like, East L.A. when I was young. Um, and so, anyways. I was just always enamored with it. Like, just taken out of this reality for a second, to be cheap as fuck, right, or <laughs> whatever, um, to be taken out of this reality for a second, and then to, like, be transported into another dimension was so cool via, like, witnessing 
art, you know what I mean? I found it very mesmerizing and cool. So anyways, I met my hero, which my hero was like that type of art. You, when you see, you know, behind the scenes, you see it for what it really is. And I was like, ah, oh, well, okay. It's like not a dream that I would violently pursue anymore because I started like retracting myself and realizing like after being thrusted in the limelight and also like hearing about producers and things of that, all the insidious things that go on behind the scenes. I'm not very interested. I'm not interested in that. I could fuck my life up on my own by just following my impulses. Thank you very much. I don't think I need a lot of people doing that for me. Um, and so then I met some morticians, right? That were trying to talk me down out of being a mortician. And they were like, oh yeah, you see this and that and the other. And there was a, an elderly man and he had been a mortician in the state of Texas for quite some time. And so he was like, you wouldn't want to do that. You are a pretty little girl. You would, because I still had like my blonde ringlets and I wasn't wearing this kind of stuff like at all. I was just being who they needed me to be, like cosplaying as a normal human so I could get love. <laughs> Anyways, so <laughs> fucking myself. <laughs> being stupid, you know what I'm saying? A little stupid sesh. We all, we all do it from time to time. Allowing my codependency to fuck my life up. So anyways, this man was like, you are so adorable and you're so cute. You don't need to be around all of these things. I mean, he was like, well, no, he was from Texas. So he didn't talk like this. He was like, y'all don't want no lion, you know? And I was like, tell me, tell me now. And so he was like, and he just started, like, I guess I gave him that look. I looked him in the eye and it was like, and so he told me, he was like, well, sometimes whenever people have like fake parts, you have to get consent from or at least the place he was working at here in Texas. Every state has their own laws around, um, you know, cremation and uh, death, right? So he was saying that his major thing was that when someone has like, okay, um, you have to get a sign off if they're going to be cremated. You have to remove that because they'll explode when they're getting cremated. So he was like, sometimes you get hung up and you have to stay with the bodies in the freezer for quite some time because you're hung up on the uh, getting the consent of the family to remove said bazongas, right? Um, boobs. And so he was like, it's very difficult so imagine like somebody or even if someone has like prosthetics or like metal in their body and they choose the cremation route um they can they have to remove it like pacemaker shit like that but you have to get you have to get con con consent consent you have to get consent from the families so he was like the biggest hang up was like people arguing over removing false breasts or whatever like fake boobs and things like that so they don't blow up in the uh, the fires of the cremation places and not every funeral home has their own cremation place sometimes they gotta like ding, 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 down the way and like it's a multiple um levels of working with all of these businesses together to create the illusion that death is free it's not <laughs> when someone dies it costs a lot of money to the residual family members and it's a very taxing and vexing process not one that i would recommend and um yeah after having two parents die within a four month span you start to realize how expensive death truly is for not just like emotionally and like mental and like it takes years off of you because you have to deal with all of these things and then process it and perhaps go to therapy which costs another whatever however much money you're going to spend there right however much time you're going to take off of work right however much shit you have to like also go there and be for other family members constantly blah 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 <sighs> cremation varies from funeral home to funeral home and they can price gouge the fuck out of you depending on whatever the fuck they feel truthfully i found one person in houston texas that is like basically family to me now because they've cremated both of my parents and such a short amount of time and we're such good friends now we're on first name basis with our <laughs> with our morticians and when we were talking it was really sad because he was saying that um 
his children, the, the, his, my mortician's uh, business has been in his family until him. And then his kids actually don't want to take it over. They want to go become professional athletes, which is cool, whatever, right? You don't have to follow your family's footsteps. But he was like, I guess whenever I die and my wife dies and we go, I guess the business is going to go. And I was like, fuck, man. I was like, dude, that's so sad. What the heck? And he's like, yeah, but I mean, it is what it is. It's been in our family for so long and now nobody wants to continue the family thing. And we can't find anybody to take it over and blah, 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 blah. And I was like, damn, that sucks. Because that's something I always wanted to do, you know, was be a mortician to have a practice like that. Um, to take care of the dead. But also there's like, it ties into like special effects. You have to do makeup and art on people. So to make them presentable for open caskets. And also like, I love anatomy and physiology. So I love the uh, scientific like dissection of things. And um, so it was just like the best thing for me is to pursue a career there, right? Um, because I find it extremely fascinating. I have a stomach for it and um, I have like a, an extreme amount of want and desire to care for the dead um, because death is such a really important part of life and it is so, <laughs> it happens to everybody. Um, I don't know. And I've always felt that way. I've felt that way since I was a very young little girl, you know, when I finally gave up my dreams of being a marine biologist. <laughs> I wanted to be a marine biologist. And then I was like, you know what? No, I want to be a mortician. Or a famous director. That's what I want to do. I want to write my own, like, um, I want to write my own books and I want to write my own stuff. And I used to write um, entire plays. I had a typewriter. This will be the last thing I say today because it's a very long one and I am regretting turning this thing on. So I had a typewriter um, as a child, I think I was 13, and I wrote entire, um, because I was very alone, I think we've established that, that I was a very lonely child. So it was me and my typewriter and it's funny because this is around the time that I met, maybe it wasn't 13. I must have been younger than that because it was a time around the time I met Mario Lopez <laughs> in my tiny, tiny Texas town, which is literally in the middle of fucking nowhere, like middle of nowhere. The the most insane thing that happened was some kid died on his four wheeler because he went into the ditch and it flipped over and snapped his neck. Right. Like that was the big headline news of the tiny town I lived in. The like the things that happened there, a lot of people flip their tractors over or they get, you know, DWIs, DUIs from drinking at the bar. There's bars. There's bars, cows, fields, forests. That was it. Why was Mario Lopez there? Can we please go back? Why was he there? I had a typewriter. I had a typewriter. And I would write, like, horror movies. Like, I would spend hours alone in my room writing out horror movies. And then I would take them to my friend's house on the weekend and get her to, like, ask like questions and help me edit them and when it got down to it like when it got down to like I was done with like one act I would take clear duct tape clear mass like packing tape and use that to laminate the typewriting pages to make them waterproof so I clear packing tape each side of the page and um what the fuck is wrong with me? But anyways, I would do that and then I would like be like, okay, so you read this part and I'll read that part and we'll see how this interaction goes. And um, we had this little area of town where we would go because she was also kind of lonely or whatever. Like she was also kind of lonely. So what we would do for fun when I would, you know, get out of my town and go to her town to stay at her house on the weekends or for summers or whatever. Um, there was an entrance into the sewers, right? And what we would do is the sewers, there was like a huge, um, like a ditch made out of concrete, I guess, and uh, like bridges that went over it. And oh, under the bridges, there was entrances to like the sewers and into the areas where the gutters are, you know, like the man, gut, the gutters, not the man poles, but like, you know, where, if the clown hangs out, that stuff. We used to fuck around in there all the time. Well, apparently so did homeless people and like addicts, right? But we would get some tacos from, um, that place is at Burger King. 
yeah, Burger King, the really cheap tacos. We would load up, we had like $5 and load up on cheap tacos and go eat them and sit in the sewers and like eat them. And it was in the richer area, like rich neighborhood. So, and we were very poor and weird. And everyone always called us like lesbian freaks. You know what I mean? So that like, just let me paint you a picture like this. I did look like this. But we would dress up, you know, everyone calls us lesbians, lesbians and freaks because we were hanging out together and doing stuff like this. But really, we were just, I don't know, trying to maybe find solace in each other's company. But then it turned out to be we were just very toxic for each other. It doesn't matter. So um, we'd go hang out, eat our like 50 cent tacos in the sewers, right? Well, there's a lot of girls that would pass by with their doggies, their little Pomeranians, and their little <laughs> doggies, right? Super cute dogs, right? And I guess we were just so hurt and traumatized that we just wanted to like shock people and things like that. <laughs> so sometimes we would wait for these girls to pass by and we'd <laughs> take our hands out of the sewers. I don't recommend anyone do this. We could have got like hepatitis or some kind of crazy shit. This was a long time ago and a very, very long time ago, at least over 17 years ago. So do not fucking judge me, okay? We would take our hands, grab them real quick, and then be like, <laughs> and then they'd be like, <laughs> and they'd start running. And we would sit there and laugh 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 until all of the sewers were filled with laughter and like basically pissing ourselves. Um, <sighs> So then, uh, we, we were just like, you know, uh, trolling. We were just like some fucking shitty ass mall rat kids roaming the town. I was writing horror plays and we were hanging out eating taco, cheap tacos in the sewers. When homeless people weren't there, we were there. You know what I mean? Fucking around, just doing stuff. There's nothing for us to do and we were so fucking poor. So that's how we got our kicks. We also used to like, there was a payphone, this is how long ago it was. There was a payphone around the apartment that she lived in. And I would pick it up. And I would dial the operator because it was free. And um, <laughs> I would strike up a conversation with the operator. And I'd be, they'd be like, hi, operator, how can I connect your call? And I'd be like, hey, so it's what's up? <laughs> like, and then I, I would spend like, I don't know, 30 minutes a day um, on the phone. We would take turns, me and her, and just dialing the operator. And like, <laughs> prank calling the operator, we're so bored. <laughs> and so this one time I was like, oh my God, sit out! And of course this is wrong. This is wrong, I know this now. But we were like, <laughs> <sighs> like we'd scream and hang up. <laughs> the most unhinged shit. And then we'd pick it up. And dial the operator and be like, okay, now you do something to ruin your life. <laughs> and it got to the point where they're like, we're going to send the cops to this bay bone. And I was like, you'll never find us. <laughs> and then we'd wait, we'd laugh. And then we'd pick up the phone again and <laughs> dial the operator. Am I proud of what I did? No. Was it funny? <laughs> yeah. It was really funny, and um, I still laugh about it to this day, because what the fuck was wrong with me? Like, I miss, sometimes I miss following those stupid impulses, like hiding the sewers and grabbing girls' legs, and um, screaming profanities at people, and they're like, who's saying that? <laughs> like, watching people run, because they really thought that, like, <laughs> like, when we, like, we would say shit, like, um, that if the clown would say, like... <laughs> So we would hide in the sewers and um, we'd be like, okay, 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 okay. So, someone's coming, someone's coming. And then we're like, <clears throat> and then I'd be like, kiss me, fat boy. And then we'd hide and just wait and watch and then like watch people scream and start running and freaking out it was so funny. And, um, but now looking back, like we really needed help. <laughs> we really, really needed help. And we were not helping each other. In fact, we were egging each other on and going further and further and further because it was like us against the world. And then eventually it became us against us. And it was so sad and pathetic and like destructive and toxic. But when we were good, when we were using our pain and trauma and like 
doing stupid shit out in the town like as dumb little kids it was hilarious you know we used to like roll down the hill we used to roll down hills all the time um and one time we were like let's go roll down that hill but it was like a hill under a bridge like a highway bridge and the hill ended on a feeder road and so we were like playing Russian roulette with traffic and that's not good now I'm thinking about like what the fuck and like our parents didn't check on us or anything we were just roaming the town rolling down hills grabbing girls from the sewers I was writing dark ominous things on my typewriter laminating them with packing tape and god what an existence it's been yeah I don't know <laughs> meeting Mario Lopez in the hallway after having a laughing fit over dog shit from the Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy. Um, I'll never forgive him because what the fuck was he doing there? They were like, oh, he's come to see his uh, relative or something like that. Something around that description is what I vaguely remember. I was so young, but I vaguely remember that. And it was right around the time I was doing all this other dumb shit, like getting kicked out of class for laughing, hanging out in the sewers and eating tacos, um, writing dark horror stuff and stuff like that i don't know we were just really really, really weird kids right really really weird kids <sighs> and then also it was like 50 cents for us to go to the movie theater so we would just literally walk all the way to the movie theater we back in the day people were walking us kids we would walk town to town to town pick up more kids and then create a pack and then start walking other places um it's just what we did before anyone had cars or anything we were like 13 12 14 you know what i mean no not 14 like 11 to 13 we were just like hanging out and nobody gave a fuck about us and we didn't have cell phones so <laughs> it was weird obviously i think that if we had the more access to the internet we wouldn't have been in sewers um to fucking hanging out and doing dumb shit like that but <sighs> yeah okay i'm gonna go i'm sorry Thank you. I hope you have a great day. God, I'm probably gonna hide this in my camera roll and then like edit the shit out of it later. And then like, <laughs> I'm gonna hide this for myself and then edit the shit out of it. And then like, 